elbow my way out of uh, 3M. Yeah. It's like, get out of here, guys. You order $700 billion a year. I need my $2,000 worth of brain. It's not going to work. Hi, welcome back to Detailing World. In this video, we've got an interview with Larry Casilla, the owner and founder of Ammo NYC. So over to you, Larry. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself for those who may have not watched you or know who you sure, are? Sure, sure. No, I appreciate being on. This is awesome. Very exciting. I uh, love what you guys are doing over there. So yeah, my name is Larry Casilla. I'm the owner and founder of AmmoNYC.com. We're originally based in New York City and then obviously with uh, the world uh, going a bit crazy, uh, you know, we've sort of moved everything out of New York City and into Connecticut, so it's a little uh, less chaotic, as you know, New York is, uh, is, is quite the place at the moment. Uh, but yeah, so I'm in Connecticut, and I just recently built a, a studio, and um, as you can see in the background over there, uh, Bill's got some ammo products, so we're, we're manufacturers of, uh, of cart, there you go, I like that plug. Uh, uh, we're manufacturers of, uh, of cart cleaning supplies, um, sort of in this innovative type nature and, and what I needed for my business, et cetera, et cetera. But we can talk about that, but that's sort of my background and uh, yeah, doing lots of YouTube videos. We're in the, we're in the editing suite right now. I tried to, like I was telling you guys off camera, I was trying to get the cameras all downstairs to see all the cars in the shop, but that's uh, that is a, a feat that is beyond my technical skills for some reason or another. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, I think this has took us about 20, 25 minutes to get this call live yeah. and <laughs> started. Hey, first, and I heard first you guys the whole this. time, by the way. I heard <laughs> you. I saw you. like, what is Larry doing? And I'm like hammering and typing away, trying to like, I can hear you. I can hear you. <laughs> came up here. This, this computer seems to be working. So there you go. The next point that we were, we were looking at is what actually got you into detailing? Sure. Um, it, it's a bit of a weird story. H how are we on time sort of situation? I can do the quick version. I can do the whatever you guys. As long as you want. I'm here. Okay. It's our day's done with now. So <laughs> I don't know about Bill, okay, but mine cool. is anyway. Pretty much. Makes sense. So um, <laughs> so the, the, the kind of short version, if you will, is my, uh, my mother said I was just obsessed with cleaning things. And obviously uh, I was into cars. So the two of them kind of, uh, uh, you know, worked out nicely. I have pictures of me as a child, uh, you know, with my socks all the way pulled up, et cetera, in the eighties, um, cleaning uh, these big, you know, the trucks that you, you know, little cars you get in with the pedals and the whole thing. And I'd just be outside with a wash bucket. And my mom was like, ah, this is weird, but okay. Like, you know, he's a kid, he can do whatever he wants. And washing isn't the worst thing. So I was just kind of obsessed with washing um, forever. So it wasn't like getting into detailing. It was just the cars and the cleaning uh, yeah. and then sort of combining them into two. And then I sort of came to the realization when I was working on the stock exchange, you know, the, you know, uh, when it existed in New York City, it's now all digital, but most of it's digital. And, uh, you know, how the, the good jobs and the fancy education and all these kind of things. And then uh, it really sort of hits you in the face, like what you what you prefer to do with the rest, you know, with the rest of your life. This is as, as a 20 year old kid with the rest of your life. Think, I'm thinking, you know, at that level, sort of like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? Um, and I realized maybe making eight zillion dollars a year which is what you know they want you to do there you know that's the whole mission is like how much money can you make how much money can you make i was like i, I started realizing even if i did make a gazillion dollars i was like miserable i just hated everything yeah. you, you see a lot of these guys that are just and i get it and sometimes they have to do what they have to do so i, I can appreciate that but i was young enough where i said i gotta pull the cord and, and, and get out um and so anyways the, the long story short that's it wasn't that like I got into detailing. It just was. It just is. I, I like cleaning. I like cleaning my toilets. I know it sounds weird. I like cleaning the floor. I see a little thing here. I want to vacuum on the floor right now. Like so, I like cleaning things and I love cars. So the combination of the two m made a whole lot of sense. Um, but this pre detailing. You know? Did you start with like the, the standard? Like in the UK, we have a company called like Auto Gleam. They were sort of like the, the sort of Walmart, I guess of. Um, of car cleaning products you could go to walmart pick up your mcguires and stuff did yeah. you start with like mcguires and, and that mothers and stuff like that no that's that's a great question no one's ever asked me that before i would say um no and here's why i i, I probably probably i can't remember i would imagine mcguires but basically when i started i um researched every all the the uh, detailing areas that uh, i was familiar with in my hometown after i left the stock market um, and, I, and I looked at all these different places and I found one that I thought would be the best. 
for whatever reason it was it came up for sale i mean it was just like it was like it's something that just came down from heaven or whatever so from then on i had always purchased um you know in in the states we call them you know the box trucks and things like uh, jobbers or whatever they just mm. come by with you know the little vans or whatever and they have 30 55 gallon drums or whatever five gallons and you would buy from there so um i really got hardcore into it at that point so i never really went to the store and bought things if if i can't remember but if i did i'd probably purchase mcguire's obviously you know i'm tight with barry and, and the team there so they're they're that would be the equivalent of i'm guessing auto glim auto glum auto glim how do you say okay, that yeah. Yeah, Auto Glim over there. So, um, yeah, I would I would say that McGuire's is fair, but usually, um, or I really started in the uh, in the manufacturing part of it. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've I've always had like a thousand gallons of stuff around me because my dad was a chemist, my wife's right. a PhD chemist. So it was kind of like a yeah, it was it's a weird relationship with the products. They've just always there's just always something here that we're working on and that, that has failed miserably or something. So I have like mm -hmm. a thousand gallons of this thing. You know what I mean? So it's like, a, um, it's a little it's bit like of a, that point, like that's how your product came about. You, you, the products you got didn't do maybe what you wanted them to do. And you decided yeah, it's a little cliche to say that. Like, cause a lot of people are like, Hey, it didn't work. Like the, the products worked great. I just, I needed them to do specific things. So like, um, you know, I'm a big hockey player or whatever. So like a hockey stick is a hockey stick, right? You can pass and you can do all these things, but I needed to do certain, I want a very specific tweak. I want the handle to be, so I was going to that next level where like, I, you know, a car is a car, it gets you to A and B, but I want to feel a certain way. So I would never say that those products didn't do what they were supposed to do. Yeah, they got me from A to B. They took the dirt off the car, but I was like, well, what, what if we didn't use like crazy salts? What if we didn't, you know, all these kind of things that I went to uh, when I was working and consulting as a, consultant as a detailing consultant to this manufacturing company because um, they it's a whole long story but basically chemists are really good at doing what they do and detailers are really good at what they're doing but there wasn't this meld between the two of them back in the day and so that's where i fit in um, and then that's where i started to tweak the product so i don't want to say like there wasn't anything out there for me of course they're all but there's lots of amazing products out there I, it, it's very hard to say like no one's flying to the moon to go find something special right um, so there's a limited amount of things that we can play with. And then when we go out there and we play with the graphenes and all these other crazy things that are out there, you can start pushing the boundaries a little bit. But uh, yeah, I would say that what I took on or what I was focused on was tweaking them specifically for my particular, uh, as we talked about off camera or office uh, so live thing here, you know, with the, the billionaires and the people with the big collections, I needed some little tweaks here and there. And that's, that's where the ammo came from. So what was the first product? you decided to develop oh that's a great question too the first product was the first product was was a tire shine and so i had all this i wanted to make a tire shine um that didn't shine as much as like when you're just using a solvent based um yep. which is a carcinogenic back in the day we didn't know that that was a carcinogenic you know you would spray that on there solvent based and it was just like slip and slide the whole thing you guys know that you know that story um, so I wanted to make something that was removed that because my wife you know, was the first one. I was like, Hey, this is a carcinogenic, <laughs> like, I don't care how shiny your cars are, or wheels are. You got to get this out. So, um, I removed that, but then you're like, well, you can't take a, a, a salt, a, um, uh, I'm losing the word emollient. I think of the word I'm looking for and a water and a water base. And it's very hard to get those to, to mix. Right. Yeah. So, uh, I spent a lot of time in using, and there's a picture of that picture on the website. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there's a picture of me in a, a chemist, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. smock and I'm yeah, over yeah. a 55 gallon drum. I was making that product. That was mud. That was what we call my mud, which is yeah. tire shine. And so the whole thing was contingent on making sure that the inside that I put a specific amount of water in the container first. This took like a year to figure it out for whatever reason. And it needed to be a specific temperature. So when you put the, uh, uh, when you put the, um, I cannot think of the word right now, not emollients, but the basically the stuff that makes the tire shine right yeah. out of my head. When you mix that in, you have to have a certain temperature, otherwise they'll separate right. uh, really quickly. So mm -hmm. I would say to answer your question, the first one was mud and that was by, that was like the hardest uh, one to get, you know, spray waxes and soaps are, are relatively easy to make. Uh, Water-based things um, are, are, are more challenging. Well, yeah, that leads on to um, what's the latest product? What's the latest product? 
So other than um, the new Reflex Pro, which took absolutely a staggering amount of time and money and effort to, to get going, uh, I've so I, we can talk about that one, but that one is, is absolutely kicking butt right now uh, to make something that's non-flammable and organic. When I say organic, I don't mean like organic, like apples. I mean like inorganic versus organic. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of a challenging thing for us. Uh, and then, of course, to add in what we call an additive, just like graphene, uh, right. would be uh, the antimicrobial. So we're pretty proud of having that as the first one and having tests and things like that to be able to, you know, you hold up a piece of paper and say this has been certified ABC one two three kind of thing, um, mm -hmm. but in terms of the next one that's coming out, I mentioned it earlier in one of my videos. It's called uh, uh, I called it Blush, but I think we're going to change the name to Cream Pro, which is basically a Carnuba like uh, application process, but it's yeah. a Reflex Pro, but in a in a very small. It almost looks like a blush jar, like you know your wife, your girlfriend, yeah. whatever, put on it. Um, and so the argument back and forth is, if you have a coating on your car, why would you put that on there? And so this is going to be a little bit of a controversial uh, controversial uh, product because I'm saying, do you need it? No, you absolutely don't need it. But like, I'm obsessed with doing something to my car on like a weekly, maybe yeah. bi-weekly where I'm like, okay, like, like I got to go in the garage and just like chill for a second and my brain processes in the background a decision yeah. or whatever I'm trying to do. So this is basically paste wax that has the, the reflex infused in it. And okay. so uh, do you need to do it? Probably not. But when you're putting it on there, you are, you know, fortifying what's underneath it, rejuvenating it, all that stuff. But at the end of the day, it's a cathartic type thing and it makes your car shiny like crazy. So I'm not, I'm not pretending it's anything other than that. So that's, that would be the next product that's coming. Well, I guess that's why a lot of people get into the detail and it's not just about getting your car clean it's getting away from no. the misses getting away from work getting away from whatever for a few hours on a saturday or a sunday just it's enjoy some time happiness. with your car yeah. yeah it's it's a it's something to bring you joy and if in the act of doing that you're cleaning your car and maintaining its value and all the practical things detailing to me is almost 50 50 practical and impractical it just doesn't make me sick. like yeah. Why would I like the car downstairs? I wish I could do this downstairs with you guys. You can see all the cars behind me. My car is immaculate, but before I leave, I'm um, sort of donating my car, not donating, uh, loaning it or whatever you want to call it to a museum tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, up in the States here. So for the winter, it's going to a museum. Okay. The car is immaculate. I'm going to clean it before I leave just as like a, just as a little bit like it's weird. I got a weird lump in my throat because I feel like I'm giving away, but I'm not because it's still mine. I'm letting it have it. So it's like this weird, I, I'm doing it for to say goodbye or something. I, I don't know. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? It's, it's not a practical reason. Yeah. yeah. So, so and how do you come about like developing a new product? What, what kind of your mindset about, do you just sort of like literally look at your car and think, mm, yeah, I need something else there or? No, I, I would say, you know, the, the brilliance of making a product, which a lot of people do and I haven't quite figured out yet is to make something that, uh, you know, as they say, you have to remove. You got You have to remove things. So I think adding more products, meaning seventeen different versions of spray wax or something. I'm like, I, well, I don't even. I, I don't use it in my business, so I don't know how to how to justify that. But I understand. So I like to remove as much as I can. So sometimes when I come out with a new product, I try to remove an old one that maybe didn't work or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so when I come up with a new product to answer your question, it's more of a. It's on a need basis, right? So think about it. Like window cleaner. I used to make a ton of window cleaner. And uh, it was so smelly. And I, I used to do it in five gallon, these five gallon jugs on the floor. I remember doing this. And my mom came in one day uh, to the th to the factory where I was working. And I said, oh, hey, mom, I went like that. And I told the mask like that. And then I looked back over and the fumes from the ammonia came up and hit me and I, I passed out <laughs> and I hit the ground. Cause I, so what am I saying? I'm saying it's easy to make products, but it's hard to make them um, useful or different or better for the lack of a better word um so sometimes i just don't come out with it again window cleaner I, it's hard for me to compete with window cleaners because they're incredibly cheap yeah. they're all basically do the same thing and they're all great they're like why, why would i come out with something else if it's already great right abrasives is another one how come you don't come out with an abrasive anymore i was like truth of the matter is i can't get the the, the best abrasives possible i can't when i'm going to elbow my way out of uh, 3m yeah. Like, get out of here, guys. You order $700 billion a year. I need my $2,000 worth of bread. It's not going to work. Um, so that's why, you know, Rupes and Meguiar's and companies like, you know, larger ones, they can, 
they can make stuff like that. So I really look at it and say, what do I really need? And can I make an improvement on it? Because if I can't, you know, it's it's ceramic and graphene not in your mix at the moment. Uh, Yes. So of course, um, you know, like anything else, you have to be careful about what you say. But uh, before I say things like that, which I didn't in the past, so I'm comfortable saying it now, with respect to graphene, there is no way I'm saying uh, that it's 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 not good and you know you shouldn't buy this. But I, I go like you know to each his own. That's totally cool. And don't listen to me. I have my own product line, so obviously I'm biased to my product line. It's completely logical, I think, from what I've read and from what I've learned and from the people that I pay to help me understand things that I don't understand. Meaning the really you know these uh, graphene graphene in particular. From what I have in actual writing um, from PhD chemists, three of them, um, you know, I can, I read it on camera before, I'm happy to read it again, but basically they're claiming, uh, and I can understand their logic right now, that it is more of a buzzword. Because to get graphene in a particular, to make it feasible on paint, it's it's entirely too thick for it to have the characteristics, from what I understand. to benefit those characters, have the benefit of those characteristics on your car. Yeah. So you then have to water it down as you water things down for the lack of a better, I mean, you thin them out. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're getting down into like one micron, I mean, uh, one atom thick. And you're like, like, I don't even understand how can one atom do those things. So really um, it, it kind of boil, it boils down to it's changing the color, meaning it's becoming like a, it's more of a powder now and it's changing the color from clear to brown to black. So people immediately think marketing, right? Yeah. And then a lot of the times it's the resin that's actually doing the hydrophobic, or creating the hydrophobic nature to the product. So there's a bit of marketing behind it. Does that mean that graphene doesn't work? There may, there may be, there may be characteristics, but it's right now it's, it's, it's like this with the resin. It's so intertwined. You don't know what's the graphene and what's the resin. And typically what we're looking at the way that we interpret it is it's the resin and then you have an additive. So it's not really a graphene coating. Like my coating isn't an antimicrobial coating. It's a coating with an additive of antimicrobial. It's a coating with a graphene additive. Mm. And so we're just saying what's more important, at least in this day and age, COVID, all the things, graphene or antimicrobial? Yeah. Yeah. Six and one half dozen in the other. So I would say to answer your question right now, until the chemistry changes, which it, I mean, it could change tomorrow. I have no idea. I I have no plans of putting graphene. I'm going to, I like to sit back and look and do the chemistry and be like, uh, let's see what's going on. I don't want to be the first one to, to be out there on something like that. It's too, it's too crazy for me. So ammo NYC, mm-hmm. what's next? You've obviously got the training academy thing coming along. I understand. I do. It was perfect timing. As soon as you create a training academy and spend your life savings on the building, then the world collapses and you can't have anybody <laughs> in your building anymore. <laughs> How, uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. Just, I'm just going to interrupt you there. How yeah. far behind are we in seeing that? So I think, is it about a month ago, I think that video came onto YouTube? So when did all that? Cause you, you did one big like 35, 40 minute video. Right, um, right. So when did all that actually start? Then you say COVID's obviously delayed things. What was that beginning of this year right. or the back end of last? It was back of last year. So I purchased the building October 4th of 2019. Yeah, 2019, and then there was permits, and I'm sure you guys have built something or whatever. It's just like a total nightmare to go through all the paperwork. And then finally you start swinging hammers and whatnot. And that was probably probably February-ish, something like that, up to 20. And then it took, you know, it was supposed to take three months, and then, of course, it took six months kind of thing. It's (laughs) it's normal, you know, it's a normal kind of thing. And so we only really wrapped up maybe maybe a, a month and a half ago. And we're still putting... You know, pictures on the wall, and I don't have enough chairs. I don't know if you see. There's no <laughs> chairs over here. There's, we got to throw in. See the air conditioner right mm-hmm. there, because I'm on the third floor. You see all the padding in here. Yeah, it's so insulated for the sound. There's like no echo, which is great because I can go like this with my. You see my microphones here. I got all my yeah. microphones for podcasts and all that kind of voiceovers. Um, but I had to put a. I was sitting here like dripping sweat at the end of the summer. I'm like we got to do something, so they threw an air conditioner in, but. Uh, not really great for background and stuff. But, so this yeah. is that, um, is this that top office with that funky wall top, you top, put in top. the back? So super, we're at the, this is, I'm touching the ceiling right now. <laughs> oh yeah, you can see it back there. See the ceiling? Yeah. It's yeah. a sloped ceiling, so it goes like this. Nice. <laughs> all the way up. So, um, yeah, it's, it was, 
it was more of like a storage area kind All of right. thing. Um, and then uh, the interesting part is when I purchased the building, uh, it, you couldn't, at least in U.S. law, you couldn't um, uh, you couldn't use that as a price per square foot, meaning you couldn't add that if it was 1,000 square feet, I'm using a round number, mm -hmm. you couldn't use the storage loft as a 1,500 square feet times $300 a square foot or whatever it was. Right. Yeah, yeah. So like, oh man, we got to sell this. And then when I bought it, I immediately went back in and rezoned it so that I could use it here, which if you think about it, was like, it was a great move because the guy didn't want to deal with it. And I said, great, I'll mm -hmm. buy it undervalued, rezone it. And then instantly I doubled my square feet, which if you get where I'm going with that, if it was $300 a square foot, I just doubled it. Yeah. I doubled my money with it. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. Yeah. that's what, that's what this is right now. This was just cool. like a bunch of two by fours or something up here before. <laughs> so, so the Academy will be you personally teaching people. Yep. Yep. I have, uh, I'm trying to keep it a little bit under wraps, but definitely me. And I have four superstars uh, coming in that people just want to see and, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it, I try to think of it like, and I'm trying to be careful because um, you have to understand, you know, sometimes it's challenging because if I say like too much of what the, the um, you know, what the product is or what I'm trying to do, then like, bang, it's, it, it comes out too quick. And mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, I, I have 10 examples of, of products or patents and things that I've worked on and intellectual trademark and all these kind of things. And then as soon as I release it, another company comes out with it. I have like five examples of it, yeah. but they're all little stuff, so I can't talk about it. But um, so the answer is yes, I have superstar guys, but I will say this, it's going to be a little bit more of like Navy SEAL kind of training. Okay. Um, so it's not like open for, um, I want to be around people who uh, are willing to cut their arms off, figuratively speaking, to do the things that we're doing. Because um, I'm, not, I'm not super great at motivating people in person because I'm really... Uh, laser beam focused on trying to execute a particular thing. So mm -hmm. it's like, I don't know, what a, like lateness. Like if you're late, yeah. like my brain explodes. Like I just can't, I'd be like, how could you, like, well, I don't understand. Like I can't sleep the night before planning my day and my clothes to get up at a certain time to get there an hour. But you know, this kind of thing, it's like an army thing. Like if you're not, like if you're 20 minutes late, so the running joke in my family is if you don't work on Sunday, don't plan on coming in on Monday kind of thing. And I like that philosophy. So I wanted to make the training like, like we're gonna hustle. Like this isn't gonna be like let's sit in front of a you know and I'm, and they're great. All those classes are great. But I wanted to throw people into the deep end um, and really what we do call hyper learning. I really wanted them to struggle and feel the pain of all the things, and then at the end be like, oh, I see what the purpose was behind this training. To really not to like make them feel cool or make me feel cool. It's really about like how can we jam as much education and um, experience, which you just don't get, right? Yep. Experience is experience. You get that in 20 years. Mm -hmm. But how much experience can I take from the four superstars that I bring in and yep. compress that into a certain amount of time and jam it into somebody's head so that when they do that in 15 years, they go, I remember we talked. I can't remember what it was. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. And it kind of triggers something back. So it's a lot more than, uh, and I respect everyone that's doing it because we're going to do it too, but like <laughs> slideshows and like here's the definition of that and here's the definition of this. For me, I don't process that well. I have to go in and like burn my knuckle and be like, whoa, I can't do that one again. Or have an actual piece of a, a, a car and I say, see this car right here and it's blue? This is what I'll give you too much information. See this blue car that we have? And they're like, yeah. I just paid $2,000 for that car. And they go like, okay. I want you to remove the paint with your buffer. I want that to be metal by the time we're done. And they're gonna be like, I don't understand. I said, remove the paint off that car with your buffer and they're going to just their brains are going to explode <laughs> but i want people to come in and remove the paint why like a race car driver you got to have them drive it into the wall every once in a while to figure yeah. out well, well there's the limit I, I found it so yeah. things like that that i think are outside the box for people obviously we're going to polish fancy ferraris and all these other things but it's kind of like okay fine but is that helping i i, I don't know maybe a little experience on an expensive car but i think those finding the limits of of where you can damage a car is super helpful to, to detailers. Like yeah. when I burned my first car, I remember exactly where it was and I exactly the, the color of the car and where, where it happened on the car. And I never did it again. I learned the difference between metal heat absorption versus plastic heat absorption. Oh gosh, when I go on a bumper, I'm like, you know what I mean? In, in my mind, I want to go a little bit uh, easier than let's say a hood that's metal. 
yeah. things like that. I want them to kind of remember. So anyways, hopefully that may be too much information, <laughs> but that's what I'm trying to shoot uh, for. And was your first burn through on a plastic component then? Mm -hmm. I know, I know mine was, <laughs> it was on it was my own minivan. car, thankfully. <laughs> yeah, it was a minivan uh, in my, one of my first businesses. And I remember I was so like tail between my legs. Um, and I didn't realize how like impactful it would be like years later. And I went into the lady and it was a minivan. Um, it's like this odd, like burgundy red colorish, and uh, and it turned black, of course, as a bumper. Um, and then I showed it to her and she looked down at it and she's like, cool. And I was like, <laughs> I just burned through things. She's like, I could absolutely care less, but thank you for showing me. And I was like, uh, so I felt like I got like, I get out of jail free card. Yeah. I was like, I have to pay for this bumper again. Like, oh my gosh, like I, this bumper is gonna be more expensive than the car itself. You know, so uh, yeah, no, I, it is burned in my memory. So I'm trying to get people to do that but with no consequences. Right? Yeah. A five hundred dollar car, some junk car that we buy. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. It would yeah, be cool. kind of a fun a fun thing to play with. Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. What was the first car you detailed? Actually detailed. Wow. You're asking a lot of good questions. Uh, the first <laughs> car I ever detailed for like a hundred dollars or whatever it was, it was a Jeep yeah. Wrangler that had a uh, yeah, Wrangler with the top off Wrangler. Yeah. Um, with, and it was black interior uh -huh. and, uh, they had a yellow golden retriever. Um, yeah. Heck? And so it was just an absolute nightmare. And we all know like the material of the carpets on, on, a, a, a Jeep is just really, you know, kind of nappy and it just mm -hmm. holds onto it. So that was my, that was my first ever, uh, detail. I did that in my driveway. And at the, at the time, because we're in the Northeast here, um, it gets really cold. Yeah. And so my father actually helped me by, uh, digging a trench from the house to the garage because the garage was separated we dug this trench through the uh, driveway because i was outside washing the car all the time and just freezing and my the house is situated so like in high school that my parents could like look outside and be like oh he's washing the car again right and i'd just be like oh, like freezing and so my dad ran a hot water line so i was like the only garage in like my area that had a hot water line so i was washing cars outside so i could just keep going all the time um so yeah that's that's a good question i hadn't thought about that one in a long time yeah that that was uh that was in, uh, that was in 19, uh, oh my gosh, I sound super old when I say that, 1995. Cool. 1995. Yeah. Do you want to that then? What's the, What's best, that? what's the best car you've ever detailed? Uh, loaded, loaded question. Um, it can be I think the best in terms of value? Not necessarily value, but the best car you think you've ever detailed. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> you all right there, buddy? I'm fine. <laughs> all right, good. Let's go. <laughs> that, that might be. He's making me sweat right now. You all right? Uh, you, you breathing okay? We need I'm to fine. Call somebody? I'm fine. All right, good. Um, I would say that.